Our text this morning are the 35th through 39th chapters of the second book of Exodus. And Moses did look upon all the work, and behold, they had done it as the Lord had commanded. Even so had they done it, and Moses blessed them. months had passed and Israel had journeyed out of the land of Egypt. Three months they traveled the wilderness road to the foot of Mount Sinai. Another three months they had encamped there on the plain below the Mount Sinai. And it was a strange and stormy period of three months. Moses had gone away from them forty days and they knew not when and if he would ever return. And when Moses returned from the mount, he found the entire camp singing and dancing about the apis bull of Egypt, the golden calf. The people had shattered the covenant they had so recently made with the Almighty, pledging themselves to be his people and he to be their God alone. Then Moses proved himself to be a true mediator. A picture of that one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Moses pleaded for forgiveness for his undeserving people. He offered to lay down his life in their stead. He based his prayer upon God's mercy, God's glory, God's promise of salvation to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob of centuries before. And Moses prevailed. God's wrath was turned away. His forgiveness was won. He renewed his covenant again with Israel. Then once more did Moses ascend up into the luminous cloud that enveloped the mount. Once more did Moses receive the written law at the hand of the Lord engraven upon two tables of stone. Once more was he given the detailed description of how Israel was to worship him with the tabernacle, their sacrifices and ceremonies. And once more did Israel wait forty days and nights for Moses' return to the camp below. And it is not hard for us to imagine what thoughts passed through their minds as they waited and waited and waited they had already come through much, but they still had a long way to go. The bondage of Egypt was behind them, passage through the Red Sea, the hunger and thirst and bitterness and attack of the enemy during their wilderness road. And now they had come only to the halfway point of their pilgrimage to the Promised Land. Only God knows what they had to face still on the journey ahead. Did they wonder and worry about it, as we so often do? Sometimes we look back over our life and it's been so damn blamed hard in the past. We wonder if we're going to have the strength and the stamina and the stuff it takes to meet the temptations and trials we know await us in the future. And like Israel of old, we begin to chase and get restless and impatient aware of our own feelings, anxious over what the future might hold, wondering and wondering what will life waiting for us around the next bend in the road. And then Moses brought word to, from the Lord to his people and to us people. And it is just about the very last possible kind of word you would ever expect. It is not at all the kind of word that anxious and restless and impatient pilgrim people want to hear. Moses returns from that 40 day span on the mountain. You know what he tells these people? These people who know that they've got a long hard road ahead of them through unfamiliar territory, to the borders of the promised land where hostile armies are waiting to drive them back into the desert. 
Do you know what Moses tells them in this and the next four chapters? We would expect him to say, Well, folks, we've got a lot to do, a long way to go. Let's get busy. Let's get this camp geared up and swing into action. Oh, he just, just exactly the opposite. Moses lays a hand on their shoulder and says, The very first thing you've got to do is hold it. Stop. Look. Remember the Lord and the Lord's Sabbath. Oh, that is hard for us to believe, as it was hard for them to believe, that our entire journey through life depends entirely upon God's birth, upon the right relationship to God, about everything depends upon God becoming number one in our life. To us, it always seems the other way around. After we've got our life straightened out, after we've got a secure job and a little nest feathered and our problems pretty well in line, then we will have time for a few emotional and spiritual stirring. After all, we people do have so very much to do. And to us it seems that the battle always goes to the swift, to the strong, to the doers of deeds. What we do seems a million times more important than what we believe. And, that, and because we think that way, that we've got to be busy providing and protecting and preserving ourselves, we notice that God suddenly disappears from our lives. We were so busy preparing for that theme paper for class or the big football game next Friday. Or we've got that dreaded doctor appointment coming up or that distasteful letter that we do not want to write. Or we've got a close call out in the automobile traffic. Or our children had a falling out with us. Or there's a family squabble that simply won't heal over all of the years. And we so see that God seems to have gone from us in these day-to-day -day problems. And people, even when we try to get away from them, look what happens on our vacations and on our weekend jaunts. Who of us anymore are trying to see the flowers of the field and the fowl of the air as proof of our Father's providential care of his own? take time to look at the night sky and see in those sparkling stars signals from our Heavenly Father to his children, I am in complete control. Who of us has time to reflect upon the remarkable rhythm of the seasons, seed time and harvest and winter following summer, as a token of the faithfulness of our God that never falters? And that's what the Lord is telling them. No, no. The needs of this life are absolutely secondary. What you shall eat and what you shall drink, wherewithal you shall be clothed and comforted, those are byproducts. Those are fringe benefits. These gifts are freely given to those who seek first the kingdom of God. I am your rest your Sabbath rest, your eternal rest. I am your Alpha and Omega, your beginning and end and all of the days in between. I know how to edit those chapters in your book, the dark valleys, and the barren stretches, when you're lonely and when you're frightened. But I must be basic, fundamental, the first thing in your life. And if you and I do not deliberately take time to remember the Lord, to honor that Sabbath day, and it is not necessary that we will be bad people, but we will be such busy people that the Lord has simply vanished out of our daily life. And this is what Moses is saying to them that I'm not going to give you a road map to Palestine. 
I'm not even going to talk to you about military strategy against the Ammonites who are waiting. The business about political and economical measures that would ensure your security is so much nonsense. First is the Lord. Let him be number one in your life and the rest will take care of itself. You wait and see. Otherwise, people, what are we going to have when the time comes that we can't be busy anymore? When our hands fall helpless back on the white sheet. When infirmity gets us or illness as we're retired and have nothing more to do. There is a very great comfort here. Our salvation does not depend upon what we do. How shall we answer? When comes our turn to step before the throne and the question comes, Who are you? And before we can get a word out, the accuser speaks up and says, Here, I know him, I have the book of his life in my hand. And I've got a lot of things written here that nobody else knows about. Words that he spoke to hurt and to harm others. Times that his child, his wife, was hoping for some word of encouragement from him, but it never came. Oh, he was a busy man, I have that down. But wait till I tell you why he was so busy. His egotistical pride. His madness, his lust and greed for more and more, more power, more material things. Oh, was he busy, Lord? I have all this marked down against him. That's who he is. Oh, boy. It depends then on what we do or have done. It's all over. But we can answer and speak up. Yes, accuser, you are right. The only trouble with your black book is it's out of date. It has all been canceled out. Yes, I have dust on my feet. My skirts are soiled and my hands are unclean and there are gaps and omissions in the diary of my life. But Christ Jesus is my brother and because he is my brother, I too am your child, O Father in heaven. People, if you believe that, if your salvation is of the Lord, if you are certain that your last hour is faith, you do not need to be worried about what the next minute may bring. And then Moses went on to tell the people the things they had to do to build the church. Take a collection, engage some craftsmen, and then construct the sanctuary of the Lord. And that's precisely what these chapters tell us that they did. They received an offering Everyone, man and woman, rich and poor, who was of a willing spirit, gave. They gave gold and silver and brass, wood and spices and oil and precious stones. They gave fine braided linen, skins and hides of every kind. In fact, they gave so much, the text tells us, that it was more than they needed. In fact, they had to proclaim, cut it out. They had to restrain the people from offering. And why is that, do you suppose? Well, people, they gave it of their heart. And if you in your heart believe that you have been redeemed, that you belong to God, that he has borne you these many days of your life on eagles' wings, then he has forgiven you that this hour and your last hour are safe in him. All anybody has to tell you to do is the Lord has need. And that's what Jesus told the twelve when he sent them out. When he needed a coat to ride upon on that Palm Sunday. When he needed an upper room and apartment in Jerusalem on Monday, Thursday. All he said was, you go tell them the Lord has need. But be sure it's the Lord and be sure it's the need. 
God's people always know how to respond. And then they had a pick some craftsmen. Men who know how to work with their hands. Skilled tradesmen who knew how to construct the tabernacle. And men who had the heart that would evidence itself in the work that they did. God chose two men, Zaliel and Aholiel. Zaliel seems to have known how to work with metal, with stone, and with wood. Aholiel knew how to embroider, to engrave, and to enhance and carve the finished product. And those two men headed up the work. And God gives this church men who are specially gifted, who can do things that I could never think of doing. Things all that have to be done as long as we're on this earth. Last week, lightning hit and knocked the power out of our church. The week before that, the plumbing made fixed. And before that, it was just parking lot, and then the wood and the paint and the floors. But God always gives his people the craftsmen. But more miraculously, he gave the craftsmen the heart to want to do it. And then they came to construction of the tabernacle itself. There was the shell of the small building, the curtains, the covering, the pins, the bars, the braces, and the boards. And then the two rooms were divided to the Holy of Holies and the other room, the Holy Place. In the little room was placed the Ark of the Covenant, that small chest of ecclesia wood covered with gold, a mercy seat upon top, on which were spread the wings of two tall cherubim. The furniture in the other room was the golden altar of incense, the gold-plated table for the showbread, and also the seven-branch candlestick. Out in the courtyard, two other pieces of furniture stood. The large brass bowl for lazy, for cleansing, and way out in front, the brass altar for the burnt offering. And all of this was surrounded by a curtain, an enclosure that set off the tabernacle from the rest of the camp. And what struck me reading this again is the minor details. The little things that are mentioned, how many little knobs there had to be on each one of the seven branches of the candlestick. Exactly how many folds there had to be in that curtain on the north wall of the sanctuary. There's great comfort in that, people. But the Lord is talking about the details of our worship and of our lives. Will the world have peace? When shall our final hour come? I don't know about those great things. For my life is mostly made up of trivial things. Little things like the torment of a toothache. Like being late for an appointment and getting all the lights lit. And that the Lord cares. <laughs> then I can trust him for all of the little things in my life. Whether it's taking a trip to Madison or having company visit at the house. These things, too, I can lay in his hand. And you wonder, did the children of Israel see the picture? How perfectly this pattern portrayed the coming Christ, his person, his work, and his office. Did they see the significance of one door to approach God? First the altar of sacrifice, and then comes the forgiveness. And if you are cleansed and fully forgiven, then you can have fellowship with God in the sanctuary. Prayers at the altar of incense. Daily food from the table of showbread. And life, the eternal life of the eye of Israel that ever watches over you. Did they see how the high priest alone went once a year into the Holy of Holies, into the place where God's glory dwelt and brought them back a blessing. Did they see in that the picture of Christ Jesus? 
Or did they puzzle as we do so often with our religion? Wondering what all these odd details mean, just how does baptism fit into all this? Did they ask themselves, you know, why were there twelve stones on the breastplate of the high priest? Each one different. Was it to show that each one of God's children is different and still precious? And that God bears them all upon his heart? They had to inquire. And anyway, within six months, they had the tabernacle completed. Eight times, we are told, they completed it exactly as the Lord had commanded. They did not add anything on their own. They did not take away. They trusted that God knew what he was doing when he set it up that way. And if we worship God the way that he would have us worship, there is a very great blessing in that. That's how the chapter closes. Moses made a very great blessing upon them. Amen. Peace of God which passeth all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.